Today we will fi finally talk about symmetric polynomials. Uh, but before that, I have two very technical points to address. This is a bit of a rough start of the morning to go straight into technical details, but you know, this is really some things I should have said in previous lectures I didn't have time to. So one quick word about additive versus multiplicative spectral parameters. So remember that we, so far our, our matrix has been parameterized for the six vertex model uh, this way. We had weights of the form QZ minus Q inverse Z inverse, Z minus Z inverse, Q minus Q inverse, uh, Q minus Q inverse, Z minus Z inverse, uh, QZ minus Q inverse Z inverse. Um, and the, the young baxter equation always involved ratios of uh, spectral parameters. But sometimes another parameterization is more convenient. For example, if you have, if you're in the regime where Q is of modulus one, which I remind you is related to a delta uh, less or equal to one, um, then it's actually much more convenient to rewrite it as Q ex equals exponential I gamma, where gamma is now a real parameter. And also in the same way for the weights to be real up to overall normalization, you need as well Z to be uh, of modulus one. And you may as well write it conventionally, we write it usually this way, where X again is some real parameter. And if you allow me to, by a bit of abuse of notation, rewrite this as R of X, of, um, then the young master equation now takes the additive form, which is uh, R, uh, okay, which, <coughs> which are my conventions? Let me check really quickly uh, that the X is actually the, what I just wrote. Um, okay, where are my notes? Sorry, I need to open my notes. Here we go. Um, that was there. Right. Uh, so x1 minus x2, yeah, that's correct. All right. Uh, x1 minus x2, r13 of x1 minus x3, r23 of x2 minus x3, and, and the obvious thing on the other side. So. Um, So that's the additive version of uh, the young baxter equation. Now, one reason this is actually convenient is if you now consider the, the special case we have ignored so far, which is delta equals plus or minus one, the limiting values, you see that corresponds in this, in, the, in this language to taking gamma to zero, or let, let's say delta equals plus one. Just, it doesn't matter, the same could be said for delta equals minus one. That corresponds to taking gamma equals to zero. And then you see that naturally up to overall scaling, uh, the R matrix becomes a rational function of X. So it's, it's much more natural uh, you know, the, these X variables um, are the only ones you can really use at that point. And you get a parameterization of the form, something like, um, you know, X plus one, maybe up to, up to overall normalization. Um, X, one, one, X, X plus one, which is the classical, you know, young solution of the young Baxter equation. And this is, so this is so-called rational solutions of young Baxter equations. So, um, so the point is that whereas in the multiplicative version, uh, the solutions look at are, of course, rational, but once you do this reparameterization, they would be actually trigonometric functions of, uh, of Z. So usually the, 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 all the solutions we've been considering so far are so-called trigonometric solutions of the young Baxter equation. But sometimes you may want to consider rational solutions of the young Baxter equation, and then you have to use this additive form of the young Baxter equation. So I'm saying this because in, in, in today we're actually going to use both additive and uh, multiplicative, well, both rational and trigonometric solutions of the young Baxter equation. So that's point number one. Uh, the second technical point is something we've been carefully avoiding so far, and except in a very special case, was to allow for the uh, weights that we have to be, uh, to not preserve the uh, re reversal of uh, arrows, basically. That means we always assumed pretty much that this is equal to this, and this to this, and this one to this one. Um, we cheated a little bit at some point, we changed the, the C weights, but the C weights we, we discovered were actually completely harmless. But we definitely always want to have A1 equals A2 and B1 equals B2 so far. But actually, uh, it's well known that this is not necessary. And um, today I will actually need a solution which is well known to many of you, which is this um, 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 stochastic uh, R matrix, um, the sto stochastic six vertex R matrix. So let me introduce it uh, in my notations. So, oh, okay, X should have been Z, I guess. Oops. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, 
Well, yeah, this is not the same access here. This is still a multiplicative. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, limitations are already not so good for. Um, yeah, so x here is a multiplicative spectral parameter. T is roughly the same as what we used to be called q squared. Um, and, and this x is roughly what used to be called z squared. So if you do that substitution, you'll find that this our matrix looks pretty close to that one, but not quite. And the reason is not quite is because the b weights here are not the same. The c weights are also not the same, but that's not a big deal. But mo most importantly, uh, these two weights are actually not the same. But still, the point is that um, you know, this still satisfies the young bachelor equation. In fact, there is a whole one parameter family which interpolates between the uh, rever you know, uh, parity invariant um, 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 matrix and this uh, stochastic um, matrix. I'll tell you in a sec, if, in case you've never seen it before, why it's stochastic. But the point is it does satisfy the Young-Bastor equation. Um, so in this case, uh, let me just, so it's the multiplicative one, right? So I'll just write maybe one side. And, uh, and it's a bit unfortunate that I use the letter x for this, but so usual multiplicative young baxter equation. And I'll, I'll, if you've never you know, seen this before, you'll have to check, you'll have to believe me that it satisfies the young baxter equation. Um, the additional property it satisfies, which is quite remarkable, is that if you sum the columns, uh, you'll always get um, uh, the same quantity, which is one minus two tx. So in other words, what I'm saying is that if you take the covector one, 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 uh, you, you check immediately that this multiplied by r of x, it's just one minus tx times one, 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 one. Okay, and we'll need this property later, so I'm just kind of keep it, keeping it in store for, for later. Ah, uh, yeah, right, so, yes, uh, no, I screwed up, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, let's try again. Uh, T1 minus x, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that happened. Yes, of course. Um, all good now, it's correct? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is for a little bit later. Now we, we'll get back to um, uh, on track. So the, the ob objective today is to talk about true polynomials and some other generalizations. All right, so, so I'm not gonna redefine true polynomials because they were defined to, to you by um, Oli uh last week, I believe. So I literally just looked at his notes and uh, looked at how he defined it. He defined it in, in two ways. One of them is involving uh, uh, semi-standard Young tableau. So we'll start with that definition. So for, for, let's say that for us a true polynomial, uh, I'll um, okay, maybe I should open it yet, sorry. We'll get there in a second. So now we're talking about true polynomials. We have a partition, lambda, and um, And the, um, one of the definitions that was given to you by Oli is that it's the sum over all the semi stadiate Young tableau T of shape lambda um, of basically you know, the product of all the x times um, Tij, where Tij is the, uh, the content in box Ij. And so it's a polynomial in the x's. Um, and so I'm not going to go, go back to that because I, you, you, so how about we just work on an example, um, which is the same, I, I literally just um, took that example from uh, Oli Varner's uh, lectures. He um, considered the, the shape S lambda, I'm uh, sorry, lambda equals one to four, and then he considered the various uh, semi-sonic neon tableaus associated to it, and this is one of them, right? And so in this case, that means the corresponding uh, monomial would be X1 squared, uh, x2 squared, uh, x3 squared, x4. And of course there are many other terms in this, uh, in this expansion, but let's, let's say we focus just on this term. Uh, so what you've been told is that there's another way of describing the exact same thing, which is in terms of uh, path. And of course today I, I wanna use this description in terms of path because um, this is very close to what we've been discussing so far. And um, the uh, picture, again, in, in, in his lectures that I found is that the you can draw the corresponding path as follows. They're, the path starts at the bottom, they neatly stack together, so they're one unit, lattice unit next to each other on a horizontal line, and then they move up and to the right, and the rule is that the tableau tells you when the path goes to the right. So that means uh, you divide the, um, 
uh, the uh, vertical direction into successive steps, which are actually, in my notation, half, half a step shifted compared to Oli, uh, which is fine. This is just a matter of taste. You'll see why this is the right way to do it for us. And, and the, the point is that if, for example, uh, the, the bottom row of the tableau is the leftmost path, and, and the three here is telling you that the path goes up all the time except it does one step to the right at location three. And similarly, the second row tells you that the, well, the, the one before the last tells you that you have a path, the next path goes up and then goes right at, at steps two and three. And finally, the final, um, the final, um, the final path, which is the first row, um, makes right steps at one, one, two, four. And from the point of view of the path, that means the way you should think about the, 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 the weight you associate to each tableau is simply uh, the, the, the right steps. That means here we have a step x1 squared associated to that row, x2 squared to that row, x3 squared to that row, and x4 to that row. And that's looking also pretty good, because remember in all our pictures, um, we always had those kind of Boltzmann weights that depended on row and column. So here you see we don't have columns, but we suddenly have rows, which is exactly um, of the right shape. So this is kind of looking good to connect to what we've been discussing in the previous lectures. And so in other words, um, what I wanted to do next is to uh, literally say that this is some partition function of some uh, lattice model. And you could do it directly at this stage, but it would not be satisfactory. Um, this is a little game one can play. We can try to directly consider this as a vertex model as written here. And yeah, you, sure enough, you, it will work. It'll be integrable, but it's not exactly the right form for me. So I'm going to do something funny first before uh, you know, applying the whole strategy that we've been doing so far, expressing everything as partition functions. I'm going to do the following. I'm going to distort this picture by sort of slanting it to the right so that each step up is now becoming a step diagonally northeast. And uh, I spared you the effort of actually doing this explicitly on this example. This is the result on the board. I kind of ran out a little bit of space here, but um, up to this half, uh, well, there's a little bit missing here. But um, these are the exact same path, but except instead of going up, now they're going northeast. And, and the, the right steps are untouched. And if you do that, uh, you realize that very neatly now, you can divide not only horizontally into rows, but also vertically into columns. Um, so this is these, this little purple square lattice that I, that I drew for you on the board. And there are not so many local configurations, basically. The, in, inside each purple, um, wait, I had purple somewhere. Yes. So, um, so before we proceed and actually, you know, I'm going to eventually write you an, an, a mathematical statement, but first let's just play with the picture. Um, so if you look carefully at this picture, you realize that there are exactly five possible uh, ways, uh, five possible pictures inside a given square. All right, um, it can be empty, it can be, okay, where's the right? Um, okay, so let me start on the contrary. It can be like this, um, yeah, empty. It can be, okay, let me do also the, uh, this one, or this one, or this one. And I claim this is everything you need to build these paths. These are the kind of elementary building blocks of all these paths. Now this is looking kind of similar to what we've seen before, but not quite because it, it has, we, we used to six vertex models and this is only, has only five of them, so we've somehow lost one in the process. But anyway, so. Five vertices. Okay, so if you try to put this into a matrix, um, you realize that, um, so by now we used to not distinguish any, any more R and L, so I'm just gonna call it R. Um, it has the following shape. So um, it's gonna be very similar to this one, so obviously, so, um, Uh, let me, um, uh, yes, let me use this. Um, so we, we need to have Boltzmann weights for each of these. So I'm gonna assign a weight of one to everyone. 
and went, went of x to this one. Why? Um, yeah, it's a bit annoying. I really have to change this x to a z because it's ridiculous. I'm going to have too many x's. Sorry. Change my mind. This is going to be maybe big, big z to, I know, big z is a petition function. Uh, w, here we go. I need another letter. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, this is meant now a W officially, and not an X, because otherwise uh, this is definitely not the same X as here. All right, so um, if we try to turn this into yeah, a matrix, we have to assign Boltzmann weights, and remember that we realized that the steps to the right were the ones that were counted in the um, uh, summation of a semi-standard Young tableau, so it's very natural to assign a Boltzmann weight of X to, to this one. And now the R matrix looks like, so, so again, you have to remember that um, uh, the columns is telling you what's happening um, in this half of the, of the, of the um, box. It's the input. Remember, we have kind of a direction of time this way. So the column is telling you uh, the input. And with my conventions, that means this is an input which is red, red. And that's the fourth entry in the, uh, uh, the fourth column. And so my convention here is that the uh, C2 is the span of uh, empty and red. And yes, I know in the first lecture I actually had the reverse. It was actually occupied empty. And so that means if you remember from the first lecture, this, these red lines are actually the empty sites and the empty sites are the blue lines. So I, at least I, I tried to change colors so that you don't get too much confused about that. But anyway, up to this annoying feature that I had to switch several times already uh, between path occupied and empty, um, the result is that you get here uh, one, one, um, you're going to get x here, and then 0 here, and then 1 here, and 1 here. So let's check that we agree. Uh, the only interesting one is this one, which corresponds to um, uh, the, so is this correct, or is it the x below? Yeah, this is the only question. So let me check quickly in my notes that I agree with myself, at least. Um, Right, so the x should be, no, that doesn't work, damn it. Uh, that's terrible. Yeah, these conventions can be really annoying, and uh, I think the x may be on the contrary. Jules, help. <laughs> uh, okay, I have to check my notes, sorry. Um, Yeah, that's slightly annoying because I may have to switch the. Uh, um, okay, let's check. Um, okay, so there's a small possibility that because I switched so many times between occupied and empty, it might be that the. Rosen calls and switch, so I have to check that. Uh, maybe, um, okay. Well, that kind of sucks, because I wanted to say that it, it's the t goes to zero of this one, but uh, yeah. All right, all right, so I have to go back to really quickly to for, for, for reference for this. Um, so, the factor of t is on the, yeah, I guess, I guess I, I screwed up when I wrote it here then. All right, well, change of plan. Um, sorry about that. We need to switch once more. So this was 1 minus x, 1 minus w, um, t1 minus w. Um, and therefore here, one minus t here, I guess, and then w one minus t here. Uh, hopefully, this is enough to fix everything. Um, okay, it doesn't really change anything. Obviously, it's all about permuting. You know, the, what's you call occupied and empty, but I can never get it right. So, hopefully, this is correct. Um, now, the point is that this is a limiting case of this one, so why? Um, the procedure is as follows. The first thing you do is you take t goes to zero, 
And that kills that entry, which is why I really wanted to have a zero here. And you get, um, so the, the um, this one becomes um, one, zero, W, one, one minus W, one. And then the next thing you do is you do this procedure that we already did, we already mentioned when we took delta goes to one. We take W to be exponential uh, gamma x, and we send x to zero, basically. And you'll find that at first order, the W is just one, and one minus W, okay, maybe minus gamma x. Just, uh, yeah, that's still, okay, let's just write it as, let me write it this way, one minus x, one minus x plus or of x squared. I really should have prepared this part better. Um, and if you do that, you realize that, you know, this will become exactly this, and therefore, we don't have to check that automatically this satisfies the additive young bachelor equation. Yeah, there are signs to be uh, fixed as usual, but this satisfies the additive version of young bachelor equation. So that's the first thing. Okay, so if you don't believe me, this is actually one of the exercises in the uh, problem, problem session coming next to check that this satisfies young Baxter equation as well as some generalizations of that. All right, the next thing we want to do is reformulate this as a petition function, and now you note something interesting here. Uh, because of the fact that these paths are tightly packed together, the first path can, must always go, say, so the, 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 the path, the, most, the rightmost path can do whatever it wants, but the, the next path, for example, has to go up one time because otherwise it bumps into the other path and these are non-intersetting lattice paths. So that means there is kind of a frozen region here which is, um, you know, this first step here, these first two steps here, and in this picture, that means um, this whole region to the left of this line is actually completely frozen, and you can remove it because all the lines are going straight always. So instead of making the lines arrive from the bottom, you might as well make them arrive from the left, right? So if you do that, um, the picture looks as follows. Um, right, right here. Is that purple? <coughs> At the bottom is completely empty now. Not too many colors. So we have occupied, occupied, occupied on the side. We have empty on the bottom. This is all empty. And then if you take a sufficiently large box so that the, all the path remain to the right of it, which means the, um, um, well, in this case, unfortunately, I ran out of space on the board, but sufficiently far to the right, everything is also empty. So this is just empty, empty, empty. And finally, at the top, what do you have? You have a non-trivial state, basically. And that state is supposed to encode somehow the partition for you. And again, this was, you, you were told by uh, um, uh, Oli that the, the, the locations can be thought of, you can compute them by just shifting the um, uh, original uh, row, the length of the rows of your, well, the, the entries of your petition by shifting them. Um, so the, the locations of the lines, okay, maybe I should follow that example. So for example, here the first one, Well, that's too big a picture. Should have prepared all the pictures in advance. Anyway, the first one is here. The second one is, uh, yeah, that's a bit too far. Uh, yeah, should have made a smaller grid maybe. Uh, so in this case, the, the first was, um, so C here, then here, and then, and the rule is basically that the, um, uh, the location of the, uh, so, location, um, yeah, let me just write it in words. The location of the um, I um, line is given by, so, you, you, so you, you always start from the bottom, which means you start from lambda, um, whatever, n plus one minus I, 
and then you shift it by i, and there's maybe a shift of uh, conventional, uh, let's see, so one, uh, okay, let me just say plus, plus a constant which needs to be fixed, and I can't be bothered fixing. But the point is, at the end of the day, um, let me, by definition, denote lambda, uh, the corresponding state, which is the um, corresponding state, which means in, in C, C2 tensor, uh, whatever the size here is, which we always denote by L, um, and which is essentially saying that it's, it's a tensor product of either, you know, uh, empty if, uh, Are occupied depending on whether there is a path arriving here. So either, so j equals uh, 1 to L, j is not equal to any of these uh, lambda n plus 1 minus i plus uh, i plus some constant, and j equals one of these, basically. And if you, if you write it this way, then you see that what you're really computing here is the following. So that's the first non-trivial statement that I'm trying to make, somewhat. Uh, is that with this um, conventions, the S uh, lambda is equal to, so what is it? So for me, the time always flows this way. So you start from the empty, so empty, 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 which is uh, um, which is just the tensor product of all these, uh, um, uh, so in other words, this is just the product, the tensor product of all these em empty states i equals 1 to l, you act with a certain transfer matrix, which I'm going to call b, and I'll remind you, these were the notations of algebra bit concepts, but I'll remind you what they were, and, oh, okay, so is it actually b here, uh, uh, the path enter to the right, but I mean, yes, at least this, this part is correct, and then finally, I compute the entry of, um, of the corresponding um, uh, basis vector in the standard uh, basis. Um, let me remind you how this uh, was defined. The where, where the transfer matrix was defined as um, the, so T of X was defined as R L zero of X dot 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 R one of X. And here, the, this is the R matrix um, that we have right here. And, and graphically, remember that this was nothing but this thing. And, and here, all the other spectral parameters are zero. Oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, that's the monotony, sorry, yeah. The, yes, currently to the monotony metric, sorry, yeah. Yes. Um, and then, we expanded this as a two by two matrix as being A of X, B of X, C of X, D of X, and that corresponded precisely to those uh, boundary conditions um, at the left and the right, and if I'm not mistaken, B is exactly the one that makes a red path appear here and nothing on the right, because my, I switched, my, my path used to be empty and vice versa. So at, at least that part is correct. Oh, there's something missing here, RL1. No, R on zero to admit. Yes, thank you. Ah, yeah, nothing is working today. It's just, uh, well, it's a good, good thing it's the last day, because, uh, all right, so zero, where well, the numbering of the, of the lines is indeed, uh, yeah. Zero, one, dot, 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 L. All right. Um, and so that statement above is pretty much a tautology. And it's essentially just the rewriting of the, um, of the rule as a sum of our young, uh, standing on tableaus. So the only subtlety is the fact that you have to choose L large enough so that, so L has to be larger than something like uh, the, um, you know, lambda one plus N, where N is the number of parts of my petition. Something like that. Uh, let's just say L large enough. So that's actually an interesting point, which is that in many cases, um, we uh, actually want to set L to infinity, 
and it's convenient to do so. So eventually at some point I will switch to an infinite system where I don't have to worry about this uh, embedding box, but I'm not sure if this is the time to do that yet. Um, right, great. Um, so uh, several observations at this stage. The first thing is we've already seen such an expression, of course, the Acting with B on the on the um, on the, the highest weight vector is exactly what we call the beta state. So secretly, all we're doing is computing the entries of a beta state. But the subtlety here is this: at this stage, we have not imposed any oh. uh, any beta equations. So this looks like a beta state, except it, sometimes we call it the off-shell beta state in the sense that it has no uh, beta equations. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that, um, right, precisely. The other one I want to, to point out is the fact that we've already seen this as well in the context of domain world boundary conditions, um, except for, again, for some weird reason I was using C instead of B because I keep getting mixed up between occupied and empty, but it's the same story. So here on three sides, this looks like domain walls, but you see on the top, it's non-trivial. So it's really more like a better state than domain walls, which was the kind of trivial case where uh, the, the top had all particles somewhere. So it's, you can think of it also as sort of partial domain wall type of partition function. All right, so what are the consequences of this formula? So what, what do we get for free, for example? Well, remember, by the, the exact, the, 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 the Young-Baxter algebra tells us um, that the B commute with, between themselves, and this is true in the current setting as well. I'm not gonna reprove it to you, but this is just an application of the uh, RLL relations, if you prefer. Um, and so in this case, we immediately know that all these B operators commute, and that's great, because that means immediately S lambda as a function of the X's is a symmetric polynomial. And we kind of wanted that, right? Because we're trying to compute um, symmetric polynomials. So yes, it's a symmetric polynomial, right? Um, well, it's polynomial because the Boltzmann weights are polynomials, symmetric polynomial in the X's. And it's symmetric because the B commute. Um, Right. Um, and I think this was actually already mentioned to you by Oli. I, I'm looking at his notes. He actually already mentioned the fact that the commutation of these objects was some si sign of integrability. So here we have it in, uh, in its full glory. Um, maybe at this stage, it's, it's the right time to do exactly what I said, which is to say the following. Um, it's, we, it's kind of natural in this setting to uh, extend the um, uh, the um, the um, vertical spaces to have an infinite number of them, both left and right, and and this leads to this notion of fermionic box space, which we may or may not have seen last week. Not really. Okay, but I still want to say a few things about that. So, in principle, obviously, to, to actually compute the, the Schur polynomial, you only need to compute the uh, partition function in the finite region, but um, it costs nothing to um, extend it. You just need to be a little bit careful that nothing is sort of divergent. And the natural way you could do it here would be um, to say the following. Suppose I extend my state uh, lambda as follows. So we have a kind of a more natural definition of the state lambda associated to a petition, uh, to any petition without any sort of bounding box, which is to say, uh, we're gonna have a, a inf an infinite line. You have to have a zero somewhere. And then the uh, particle, there's an infinite number of particles to the right, to the left, sorry. Uh, so that goes on forever. You have an infinite number of holes to the right. And uh, so you have a zero somewhere. And, um, and the rule is as follows. Um, the, uh, well, the, the, the best way to think about it is you start from sort of the vacuum, which is the state where everything is occupied to the left of zero and everything is empty to the right. And, and then what you do is the, uh, you displace 
uh, the dots according to the partition. That means, so let's take our favorite examples, example of 421. What you're saying is the rightmost particle gets moved four steps to the right. So um, <laughs> let's try to do this. One, two, three, four. Uh, the second particle gets moved two steps to the right, so that was an empty here, so it moves here. And, the, um, and so on. So the, the, in this case, there's only the third one, which moves here. And that's about it, right? So the rule is i, parti or I particle, whatever you call it, occupied site maybe, um, occupied site. Uh, counting from the, the right, of course, because well, because there's an infinite number on the left, so we can't count from the left. Uh, is displaced by lambda i, where lambda was just lambda one greater or equal to lambda dot greater or lambda. All right. Now, if you do that. Uh, you see that naturally now you have a, a partition function living on a sort of infinite strip, but it's still true. Uh, so let, let me know. So in particular, that means the um, the empty for the empty partition you have um, 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 this uh, vacuum, and it's still true that s lambda is equal to uh, an expression of the same form, which is essentially uh, lambda. Uh, B of x1, B of xn. So the only question is how to define properly these transfer matrices, and it's not too bad. Um, you, what you do is you um, declare that um, B of x is an infinite strip, indeed, uh, but such that sufficiently far to the left or to the right, uh, you can only have um, a so at some point far enough, uh, you can only have occup uh, occupied side on the uh, horizontal line. And at some point sufficiently far to the right, it's only empty. And you, of course, this kind of mimics obviously what we had in the finite case. It does seem a little bit weird because it's not completely clear what these dots have to do with these ones. But secretly, what you have to imagine is you have a bunch of lines kind of going through here. And, um, and, and these are, oh, sorry, the red lines, sorry. Yeah, my color code is also completely messed up already. These dots were supposed to be red, not purple. Um, anyway, we'll get there. Right, so sufficiently far to the left, that means you have basically have a bunch of uh, lines g going through without any choices. They're kind of rigidly, and far to the right, there's nothing, basically. So that's sufficiently far to the left. And, and the claim is that uh, this is actually a, a prescription which is enough to ensure that all the matrix entries of this uh, B are actually finite and far to the right. Because so if you have this uh, to the left, that means nothing can happen. That means the Boltzmann weights are all equal to one because the only non-trivial Boltzmann weights is this one and this can never happen far enough, basically. So this actually has finite. Though the matrix is of infinite size, its uh, entries are uh, all finite. And, and, and all the summations, and, and you can also take products and the products also um, are well defined basically. So this is um, the matrix entries themselves and of their products are well defined. So this has to be checked carefully, but you know it works basically. So um, so there's a couple of more things I want to say uh, before we go on to the second part, which is about uh, the. So this is kind of the fermionic formalism. So why fermions? So first. Uh, they're fermions because the lines are non intersiding line dispar. They, they kind of uh, satisfy an exclusion, pr exclusion uh, principle. They can't be on the same, uh, two, you can't have two, two paths on the same uh, um, site. And also, <coughs> remember that I mentioned the other, um, the, um, well, when was it? Yesterday, that um, when you're talk, talking about the six vertex model, yeah, there is this uh, parameter delta. Um, and delta, in general, um, was this parameter. It was a squared plus b squared minus c squared, but if you now allow for the possibility that um, the uh, a and b's and c, um, all, all the, the weights can be different, uh, you actually have a slightly different expression, something maybe like, like this. It doesn't really matter how you normalize it, but something like this, where 
the R matrix would be the completely general one with A1, B1, uh, B2, and so on. And if you compute it in this case, you see that uh, because one of the Bs is zero, you just get basically one times one uh, minus one times one, and you get zero, right? So really secretly, this model is a delta equals zero, uh, you know, non um, uh, parity invariant, uh, six vertex model in a special limit where one of the, the B weights is zero, and delta equals zero, we already argued, is this uh, free fermion point where, um, so, so, so what I'm saying is it's really a special case, a special limit of the delta equals zero, uh, six vertex, vertex model in some sense. And that means all the tools that uh, are, there are th all these tools that are disposable, you already saw last week apparently the uh, Lynch term, the LGB formula, um, yes, Albiano, and um, there's a whole technology there which uh, I don't really want to go into because this is precisely something that doesn't really work for general integral models, but only for free fermionic models. Uh, in particular, that means all these uh, uh, sure polynomials can be expressed as determinants, uh, which is all fine, but I'm not going to go in this direction. Uh, so that's one comment. The other comment is that really we did two different things uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in this story to get from the completely general uh, stochastic six vertex R matrix to the uh, um, uh, sure, uh, five vertex R matrix. We first sent T to zero, and then we did this expansion basically of W uh, close to um, one. But of course, there's no reason to do that. We could just st stop at the first step. And there's a, something a little bit more general, which would be only taking T goes to zero and, um, and stopping there, basically. And then you would still get this R of W to be uh, one minus T W T one minus, oh, sorry. Let me try again. Uh, you would still get this uh, a matrix with um, a zero here, but the, the weights would be, uh, the, the, it would be a little bit different. Uh, of, um, okay, I'm gonna get this right eventually. Um, right, let's try again. <laughs> one minus W, um, W, and that should be just a one, yes. Uh, which is this one. So this is still has a zero, so it's still a five vertex model. But uh, it's still, it's a, if you want, this is still a trigonometric five vertex model. It's not, it, it satisfies the multiplicative version of Young-Baxter, not, uh, this was, this was uh, additive. Oh yeah, I already read this, right above. Right, so in principle, you could consider this five vertex model and the configurations will look exactly the same. The only difference is you're gonna give some weights which are a little bit different. But the, the so the, the whole combinatorics works exactly the same and so you can define some uh, symmetric polynomials which, uh, by the exact same formula, by, uh, but using this kind of, uh, uh, trigonometric version of the, uh, uh, so you can define basically this uh, polynomials, let's call them G, uh, which are exactly of the same form, you know, like, so uh, let's see, lambda is on the, yeah, lambda B of, uh, in this case, those W, W1, dot, 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 W, K, whatever. Am I consistent on my trust of, uh, uh, yeah, not so much. N sometimes means the number of, yeah, sorry, so, uh, yeah, let's say just n, um, where you use this time this uh, kind of uh, y using the uh, trigonometric R matrix, and these polynomials are interesting in their own right. They call them, well, if you want to be pedantic, Grassmannian Grothendieck polynomials. Um, so I guess maybe I should call it GG rather than G. Um, and they're maybe not as popular as true polynomials, but they're still uh, interesting uh, to study. They have some interesting connections to uh, um, algebraic topology. And they were introduced by Lascou and Schutz and Berger uh, in that setting. So that's something you can do, and you can play pretty much the same game, but um, we're not gonna do that today, because today I wanna actually talk about something different, which is another way you can think about sure polynomials as occurring in the, um, in the, in the inter integral setting, so in the, in the world of exactly solvable statistical mechanics models. And so that will actually use uh, more, like, uh, again, the same uh, stochastic six vertex R matrix, that's why I needed it for um, both for you know, the story I just told you and, and the, the second story. So the idea is to, um, well, is this kind of like fermion boson correspondence, like in, in two dimensions we know that fermions and bosons are kind of the same, so that means there should be another bosonic description. Uh, of the same objects, but strangely enough, uh, from the po po integrable set point of view, um, the uh, the way that sure polynomials occur is now as a 
partition function of a trigonometric lattice model, which is very confusing because the same exact objects will occur in, like in two different basic integral models, which are very different. But morally, it's some kind of modernization procedure. And the way it goes is uh, as follows. So if you, so let's go back to the very same beginning, which is the, um, which is the uh, definition of the Schupp polynomials as um, uh, sums over semi-standard Gantt tableaus, which means there's sum over, over path of this, this type. And now we're going to do something different. You know, the, the fermionic version was to, to slant all the path to make them diagonal, not northeast diagonal. The bosonic version will be the following. Take these path and kind of squeeze them in such a way that the, you, let's say you, you don't move the, the leftmost path. The second path, you move one step to the right, or to the left. The third path, you move two steps to the left, and, and so on. So each path gets moved one step closer to its uh, leftmost neighbor. Now that looks a bit weird because there's a, obviously a problem. They're, they used to be completely packed at the bottom, which means they're all going to coalesce um, at the bottom. So we, we're going to have a, like a situation where different paths occur on the same side, mm -hmm. and that's okay. That's because they're bosonic, so they're allowed to do that. So now we allow the possibility that at each uh, vertical step, that means each, each, each time you have a uh, site uh, along one of the horizontal rows, you allow the fact that it, has, it can have multiple occupancy. So in this case, for example, if you just think those three paths, there are three, th there's, there's a little three here if you like. And then there's a little two here, and that's about it. Um, so, what's, so, so I've literally just drawn the same picture here. Um, and what are the rules of the game? Well, as I said, all the paths start from the same spot. And, in, in, in as soon, and, and when we move to the infinite, you know, just as we did before, eventually we'll move to a situation where we have an infinite number of paths. That means literally we have an infinite kind of source of path to the left. But let, let's ignore that for now. The point is, so you have all these paths all starting at the same point. And where do they go? Well, now it's actually much e even simpler to compute the actual displacement, which I couldn't be bothered computing properly in the fermionic language. Um, the, um, you literally just read off the, uh, ro the length of the rows, of, so the entries are repetition. So that means the first path from the left just moves, has to move, at the end of the day, has to be one step to the um, right. And the, the second one, so, so maybe that's not a great example because all the um, parts are distinct, but in principle, nothing forbids a path from arriving at the same spot if it so, just so happens that your repetition had repeated uh, entries. But um, in general, yeah, the, the rule is quite simple. The, um, the, um, if, you, if you count path from the right, then the um, ith path gets moved to, has to move lambda i steps to the right. So, and, and once again, we can play the, the little game, which is what are the local uh, configurations? And there are even fewer than before in some sense, except now we have to allow for this uh, multiple occupancy. And you get the following, and now I'm actually going to call that an L matrix. So, um, so far we've always been dealing with situation where we, we you know, we had, we used to have L matrices, but then I called them R by saying, oh, really, because they're the same, because we had this RLL relation in, in which L and R were actually the same. Here, I really want to distinguish them, and I'll come back to that point in a second. But first, let's actually, uh, so yeah, let, let's draw all the configurations. Uh, there are only four of them now, um, and so that will be this L matrix. But yeah. So um, either uh, there's a bunch of lines that go through. And now, of course, we have to allow for the fact that can be, there can be n of, m of them. So I'm going to write a little number to indicate the number of paths that go through. Or um, there is a path. Oh, 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 right. And so the other thing I'm going to do is, if you allow me to, I'm going to, this is just a vertical flip. To, uh, conform to, with the convention of a paper I wrote with Michael Wheeler on the subject, uh, I have to f flip the, the pictures. It's annoying, but otherwise everything is, uh, yeah. So we're actually going to do it the other way around. The, uh, um, let's look at the bottom one rather the, uh, the bottom picture rather than the top picture. So the path are actually going down instead of up, but everything else, of course, is exactly the same. Um, so if we do it this way, then path can go, so you can have this kind of situation. And now again, you have to allow the possibility that um, there are many lines. So let, yeah, let me just draw all the configurations and then I'll explain. Um, 
So there are only four of them, so it's not too hard. Um, there's the one where on the contrary a path dies, so uh, this one. Uh, M to M minus one. And then, so this is kind of multiple lines. And finally, um, there's the possibility that, they, that there's um, one that goes through. Uh, let me also make sure, because I made enough mistakes on my uh, conventions that I don't get the convention wrong. Um, yeah, no, it seems fine. Okay. Um, right, so, and then the, the possibility that you have M lines and um, something like this. Because, um, yeah. All right, and so the next question is, what? oh, sorry, and that's M as well. So a few things to observe. Because we squeeze the picture horizontally, there are definitely the possibility that lines can be, the vertical lines can, can be stacked together, but horizontal lines still need to be unique. That you can't have multiple lines on a, uh, uh, horizontally. So that's why th there are only these possibilities. Uh, the second thing we have to notice is we need to give uh, weights. The weights used, used to be associated with uh, um, horizontal steps. And um, in this language, that means you can associate the weight to this configuration, x. And everybody else has uh, weight one. All right. Um, I think I explained everything correctly. Um, now, yeah, so let's, let's, we turn this into a matrix. So what is this matrix? It's gonna be interesting because for a change, it's not gonna be a matrix which acts on a, 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 pro a tensor product of two factors which look the same, because one of them is now gonna have an infinite number of possibilities, right? So uh, we have basically a, um, so L is basically a axon um, C2, tensor something which is bigger, uh, Cn if you like, or Z greater or equal to zero, where a bit loosely, because uh, th th that means the, you know, the, the, the two spaces are associated respectively to this line and, and this line, basically, roughly speaking. And, um, with, with the uh, standard basis being just the, the uh, you know, M particles being at a given um, um, location al along one of those vertical lines. So um, you see that there's no chance, you know, the R matrix is always a matrix which acts on like say C2 tensor C2. This is not, you know, this is really a case where uh, we have an L matrix which is not an R matrix basically in the sense of um, uh, the RLL relations. So this is a bit of a digression, but you see when you write the RLL relations, which we are going to do very soon, um, the, 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 the way we introduced them in the, in the first lecture was to say, well, the, the Boltzmann weights were given to us that this was L, and we were trying to find an R such as this identity holds, and then, uh, well, we, and this is just a linear equation in R, so we solved it and found some solutions. But now we can play the reverse game. We're saying, we already have an R matrix. This R matrix is gonna be this one, or maybe, you know, in, in, as t goes to zero, this one. And we want to find L matrices that satisfy this uh, identity. And this is a non-trivial problem, and there is a known way to produce uh, so solutions um, of this RLL relations, knowing R and, and trying to guess L, that's the solve fusion procedure. Um, and you, you, you can find, I mean, this particular L matrix you can obtain using this fusion procedure, applying it in some sense infinitely many times. So there is an, indeed a kind of a constructive way to uh, produce this L matrix starting from the R matrix. But I'm not gonna do that today, I'm just gonna write it. And so what is the statement? So rather, so in this case, I actually wanna do the, uh, the, the general case immediately because I think there's no point in repeating, repeating it for sure polynomials and then doing it again for whole little width. So immediately what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generalize these weights. So, so I'm gonna say that um, um, these were the weights that were needed for the sure polynomial and if you allow me, I'll just reintroduce by hand the um, uh, uh, parameter t and say, how about I declare that these actually have a weight of one minus t to the power m and everybody else the same. And these will be so-called so whole literate weights. And so I, I encode these in, into a big matrix, uh, which is this L matrix. And um, the following statement then is true. Uh, which is the uh, thing that you expected. So the RLL relation is true, which means, so maybe I'll use, uh, to distinguish the, the lines which carry many particles, maybe I'll do, do them as maybe little 
um, zigzag lines. And then the RLL relation says that, you know, um, so, well, as usual, you can e either write it as an equation or as, a, as um, pictures. And so the, the picture is the, this picture, which is pretty much the same one we've been doing all along. Uh, and so with my notation, so this is x, this is y. Uh, th this is, um, um, right. And so, uh, okay, x and y. And so the R matrix is exactly the one here, right? So it's R of W equals uh, x over y. So it's multiplicative and it's given, so I'll rewrite it once more, trying to not screw up one more time, but you know, it's this one. Um, minus two minus W, minus two W. All right, and so, and, and these L matrices are the ones right above with a whole little bit, um, of course, uh, um, choice of, of uh, Boltzmann weights. And you, of course you can take T to zero, but uh, how about we don't do it? We do it, because in this case, I actually kind of like to, um, keep t in the same way that I could have kept t there, but I didn't do it, but yeah, so I want to keep it. Okay, so, so explicitly that means you have the usual identity, so r, um, one, two of x on y, l, um, one, so let's, if you number them, one, two, three, uh, l one, uh, okay, so I'm gonna screw it up again. So l, yeah, l one, three of x, uh, L2, 2, 3 of Y equals the, uh, the same thing in the other order. Uh, 1, 3 of X and uh, R1, 2 of X, X over Y. So that's the formula where, as usual, the indices denote the uh, which uh, space it acts on. And I potentially uh, wrote it the wrong way, yes. So this is this side and this is this side, yes. Because you read expressions right to left and not left to right. Incidentally, this is one big difference with the paper with Michael where we sadly write expressions left to right, which is very wrong, but anyway. Um, yeah, so most of what I'm gonna say now is based on a, a joint paper with uh, Michael Wheeler. Um, so yeah, so you can see how this is kind of interesting because one of the lines now play a plays a different role, which is why the L matrix is not the same as the R matrix. So it's kind of a, a little bit beyond what we've been doing so far. Uh, but of course the, the morale is st strictly the same. Um, and, uh, and the next step is to formulate uh, a, so what, what, are, what are true polynomials and more generally those whole little polynomials in this context? So this is gonna be the same story all over again. And there's one little subtlety I need to introduce because, you know, the highlight of uh, today will be to actually show the Cauchy identity and some generalizations of the Cauchy identity. And for that, we need both holy fluid and sort of dual holy fluid. And so we need a little bit of a, a dual object. So let me do something very stupid but a, a priori, but which is convenient. Uh, let me redefine the exact same way, but in which, so let me write L of, a star of X to be X L of one over X. That means it's the exact same um, weight, but so in other words, if you look at the pictures, that means, and uh, so it's the exact same for pictures, except the weights now have been changed a little bit. Um, this one now has weight X. Um, so everybody that used to be one, okay, I'll just write them all at once, uh, is now X and potentially with a one minus T to the power M. And the one that used to be X is now one, where, yeah, so the same story here. M, M, um, so it's just a reparameterization, but it's kind of convenient. Um, it has an important, um, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to why this is interesting and why, why it's subtly different than the original L matrix. So that, that was the L. 
Um, okay, anyway, so now, now we proceed. So what's the definition? Um, so given a um, partition lambda Uh, we uh, first associate to it a state. So that state will live on, so let me give maybe a name to, to this thing, uh, V. So again, it's gonna live basically on an infinite number of copies of this already infinite dimensional space. So that looks very infinite, but again, everything is actually finite, so it's not a big deal. So you associate something uh, lambda, which lives in um, uh, V in some sense, center, again, actually strictly positive numbers. And the way you do it is you just take the tensor product over i goes to infinity, uh, one to infinity of the basic, basis states m, let me denote it m i of lambda, where this is the occupancy number at site i. And uh, so what is this number? m i of lambda is simply uh, the number of parts of lambda which are equal to i. So that's pretty much the procedure I had above when I, when I said that the path had to end at one, two, four, that means that was the corresponding state uh, one, two, four, basically. Uh, so that's convenient because, and, and if you do the vertical flip, that means uh, with my conventions now, that means we're supposed to do the following. We're supposed to start with lambda. Let me make sure I get this right. Um, uh, yeah, that's correct. No. No, on the contrary. Uh, we read from bottom to, no, the other one, right, sorry. All right, um, so what are we supposed to do? So we're supposed to look at this picture, and so we start at the bottom, which means on the contrary, we start with a state lambda, and then we're supposed to apply a certain number of operations which correspond to each of these rows, and then at the top we have this basically um, kind of trivial configuration at the top, which corresponds to the uh, um, empty partition. So, so there are two versions of this construction. I'll give you the easiest one. The easiest one is to say that we can actually truncate, uh, just in the same way that we did for the, the Fermiani case, we can truncate right here. And kind of, oh, we're saying now that the paths are coming from the left. But there's, there's a subtlety. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come. So you actually have the choice on the left whether uh, the path is going through or not. So you have kind of like free boundary conditions. And so let's do this now. So let's define the, um, okay, so maybe I, I went was a bit ahead of myself. So let's first define the transfer matrix. So again, there'll be two of them. There'll be a T and a T star. So, so the T will be the one where, ah, round T maybe. Um, where you use L weights everywhere. And so all these vertical spaces are these copies of, uh, of this infinite dimensional R. And they're also supposed to be wavy. Let's try again. Right. And, uh, and X is here. And as usual, it, it has four components, A, B, C, D. Um, but, the, there is already a first subtlety com coming here. Let's always assume for sort of uh, analytic re reasons that X is actually a number of modules less than one. Um, the result is that if you use uh, X too many times, you, you know, you, you, you can only use this vertex a finite number of times because, uh, although because X is a modulus less than one, that means if you have X to the power infinity, you get zero. So really, uh, nothing interesting can happen in infinity. That's just a way of ensuring that in infinity, everything is empty. Because if you have a path going to infinity, uh, it will, uh, it, the, 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 um, the, you know, you, you're always gonna get one of these weights and, um, and you're gonna get an infinite number of them. That means there, there is always, among the four entries, th actually two of them are zero, basically. And which ones, so let's, th let's think, it's the output that has to be zero. So that means, uh, I think these are these two entries here. And then you have two non-trivial entries at the top, T, uh, one of x and t2 of x. And because we want to do uh, free boundary conditions, we're just going to kind of sum them. So for us, the trans matrix is going to be t1 of x plus t2 of x. And that corresponds to the boundary where it's, uh, so once again, it's 
empty at infinity, and here is free. That means you have to sum over the two possibilities of being occupied or empty. Uh, if you play the same game with, with T star, you'll find the reverse uh, story, which is that because we, we do, did this harmless, naive, well, seemingly harmless change of uh, variables, and we still assume that x is a modulus less than one, uh, T star of x, if you define a T star of x in the obvious way, um, T star of x to be, uh, And now um, I'll put a little star to mean that each time I have a vertex here, I use L star rather than L. So L star I'll always denote by a star, basically. Whereas L was just uh, without a star. All right, so if you do this, uh, then you realize that the opposite problem occurs. You have to have a, a particle at infinity, otherwise you'll incur a weight of x to the power infinity, which is zero. So that means, on the contrary, the uh, uh, the first row is zero, and the second one uh, has two entries. And again, I take the sum of these two. Now, the statement... Ah, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, and now the proposition is that, oh, okay, by definition, sorry, um, let me de declare that P lambda of x1 dot 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 xn is, uh, so the empty, empty partition times T of x1 dot 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 T of xn uh, times lambda. And similarly, Q, let me denote Q lambda of y1 ym, let's say, that don't, doesn't have to be the same. Um, in this case, uh, we, pr we, on the contrary, wanted to make it go the other way because, because of the fact that our particles leaving at infinity, uh, it, it better be that, on the contrary, you, know, you put particles on the left rather than the right, basically. So if you think about it, these, these are the quantities that are non-trivial. Um, basically, the, each time I say something about T, there will be a, a corresponding statement about T star, and I'm not going to prove it because they are kind of uh, dearly related to each other in a kind of trivial way. So. Now, if you stare um, at um, this picture, uh, the claim is that this is literally uh, uh, this expression, basically. So you start with lambda, you evolve it using the transfer matrices, there is emptiness at infinity, and you get empty at the end. So this is literally uh, the right thing, which means in particular, at t equals zero, this has to be the sure polynomial. But uh, for general t, it's something else, and it's, it's this whole little bit polynomial. All right, so in the remaining 20 minutes, uh, I want to show some properties of these p lambdas and q lambda. Q lambdas. So they're actually closely related. You'll find that they're actually proportional to each other, but there is some annoying factors floating around which need to be taken care of. All right, so the standard thing you're supposed to do at this stage is to do the, the branching rule and check that the branching rule coincides with uh, uh, the one known for Hollywood polynomials and then you identify them with something known. But maybe, considering how any attempt today at improvising was a complete failure, maybe I'm not gonna try to improvise the uh, um, computation of the, of the branching rule. Let me just say how it would go. Um, these expressions are very naturally suited to uh, branching rules. The branching rule is about removing one variable. You m must have done it for the sure case. And you can see that corresponds to just isolating one of these transfer matrices and, and looking at how they act on, 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 the, on, the space of, uh, on the space V, basically. And so that there is, there is, if you have a single row, uh, there, there's only a certain number of moves that can take place. It's always this uh, addition of a uh, horizontal strip. But, you, but because we have now this parameter T, you have to compute the cost, if you like, of introducing an extra horizontal strip. And that will give you an explicit formula, which is this branching rule. But how about we skip that? And, um, and um, you know, the point being that, of course, if you do that, you'll recognize, indeed, the, uh, um, uh, the same expression that is known for whole little polynomials. So, um, I mean, we can always go back to that eventually, but I doubt we'll have time, so 
So um, yeah, so these are called Hollywood polynomials. Yeah. Um, so how about we actually go straight to um, proving uh, Cauchy identities? So that's another cool trick you can do when you have this formalism. Uh, you can prove a bunch of identities. And so the first one is the usual Cauchy identity, uh, which is pretty, um, which goes as follows. It's going to be more of the same tricks. We're going to apply, we're going to turn the RLL relations into RTT relations, and then we're going to see the consequences for these t of x, t of y, and t star of y. And that'll be the end of the story. That'll be it, pretty much. So let's uh, do that. So, um, oh, right. So I still have the RLL relation here. So because of the fact that L, L uh, all right, let, let's just do the, the obvious one. So um, if you apply the RLN repeatedly, you get uh, this kind of identity, which is this RTT relation, uh, where you now you have a sort of potentially infinite number of lines. And so a little bit of care has to be taken into what we mean by that, because there's an infinite number of lines. And somehow, this thing has to be sent to infinity in some sense. And um, no, actually, yeah. I'm trying to decide whether I want to do the uh, uh, the interesting case or the boring case. Well, let's do the boring case, I guess, for starters. Um, so, if you do this, so now these are all, uh, you know, all these weights are supposed to be the weights of L. So we're literally applying this identity as written here. And now what I'm going to do is here I'm going to impose free boundary conditions. Uh, and at infinity, as usual, uh, it has to be empty because otherwise, anyway, it's zero. So this identity is, is just the RTT relations. And now comes the, the, I told you at the very beginning we were supposed to use, but of course that got erased a long time ago. Uh, the fact that the, um, uh, this R matrix has a left eigenvector. So in this language, that means when you have this, um, this is literally nothing but one, 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 one times R of, uh, so uh, I'll, I should put the parameters, X and Y. Um, of x over y. And we know that this is nothing but uh, uh, 1 minus t x on y uh, divide, times the same thing. So in other words, it's exactly just this factor, whatever that is, times essentially free free. So that's kind of nice. Um, so that means here we can rewrite it immediately as just being this thing. And that's already what we want, basically. That's already. Uh, uh, the product in the appropriate order of, um, so let's see if I get it right, we read from, so t of x, t of y. This is my definition of t of x, t of y somewhere. Yes, here. And on the other hand, at infinity, uh, nothing interesting can happen. So this is zero, zero. Uh, this, is a vec uh, this is just the uh, a vertex. So that's literally just, uh, uh, no. No, I mean the reverse. Obviously, at some point, the x's and the y's have to be switched, and I guess I got it wrong. Um, y and x. Um, and so on the other on side, you have literally just, uh, and this time x is on top, y at the bottom, it's, it's free here, uh, free here. So everywhere is, is uh, the correct boundary conditions, empty. And then you have this factor at infinity, which is a of uh, uh, x on y, which is again y minus tx over y. So if you simplify, you find that um, uh, you just have the obvious uh, commutation relation. Um, uh, that uh, t, and, uh, t of x and t of y commute, as, as I suspected, this, this is a, a, a commuting family which implies that these polynomials are symmetric. We already knew this at t equals zero, but you know. Uh, with the same argument, which I'm not gonna show, you would prove, of course, that t star of x commutes with itself. Uh, so these are the boring cases. And now the, the fun case is when um, you mix them. Um, oh, actually, yeah, let me precisely keep this. 
So to get the mixed case, we're gonna rewrite the RLL relations by you know, using the fact that really L star is the same as L. So it's not a big difference. Um, uh, so in fact, we have the definition of L star right here. So that means we should have an identity of the form roughly R of X times Y, um, L1 of X, L2 star of Y equals, uh, oh, I guess the opposite, L2 star of Y of one of X R one two of X Y. So here we have the product of the X's and Y's because of this weird change of, so um, in other words, the parameters, um, okay, so I have to put a star on one of them. Oh, and as usual, I'm drawing it in reverse. Let me try to actually draw it in the correct way. Uh, no, actually, this is correct. Uh, no. No, as usual, I drew it the, uh, just like before, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's my problem. I have to reverse. All right, so um, this thing. And so x, y, x, y. And uh, so one of them is a star. That's the one with the y. So this is a, a star vertex, so to speak. There we go. And, um, and this is y inverse. That's the point because here we have a, an inverse. So I'll, I'll mark it with y inverse to remember that here we really get x over y inverse, which is indeed x times y. All right. Um, so this is the same identity which I just rewrote in terms of L star rather than L. And now we can play the same game. We're gonna iterate it, we get these kind of RTT relations, which are, well, the same. Um, ooh. Is not very pretty. Um, and oh, oh, yeah, and the um, other side, same thing. And the point is that we now go impose our favorite boundary conditions, which are free. Uh, oh, and I have to put the stars as well. So it's stars here, and x and y inverse, x y inverse. Uh, stars at the top. All right. Uh, and we're going to impose now three boundary conditions at the left. That's our choice. Um, and, and what about the, uh, the other end? Well, we know that the star vertices don't like emptiness and, and non-star vertices don't like occupancy. So we don't really have a choice. The only non-zero case is when you have uh, this. You could write the identities for all the other cases, you just get zero. So. Might as well choose the one non-trivial case, which is this one. And now we stare at this. So the first thing we have is, as usual, uh, this crossing is irrelevant because we use the property that free is a left eigenvector of the R matrix. So this is nothing but one minus TXY times just uh, this thing. Um, and I have to be careful that this is y inverse, this is x, and the stars. Well, I guess the stars can be figured out because I always use the letter y for the uh, star vert vertices, but anyway. Um, and uh, the infinity, uh, that's still the same thing. And that's already pretty much what we want. This is by definition equal to y minus t x times y times, um, um, I wish I had this in my notes somewhere because I never remember which I say. So up, so, okay, t star of y, t of x. All right, t, uh, yeah. All right, and now we go to the other side, and here, here's the fun, for the very same reason that, you know, this is already at infinity. So at infinity, the uh, unstar vertices really want to have a empty, and the star vertices want to have occupied, Any, anything else will be zero. So these two, sufficiently far to the right, uh, these two, um, 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 th there are only this possibility, basically, which means in particular, this vertex is a vertex of type B, because it has one line going through, like this. So this is a B vertex, which means this is equal to B of uh, XY, and I might as well write the answer, in fact, so this is of type B, uh, so that means it's one minus XY. 
so I have to check actually which one it is. Uh, this is the part where we see if I screwed up or not. Yeah, correct. Well, we'll probably do one half depending, depending if I got my convention right or wrong, but occupancy or emptiness, this, this should be one minus xy. And, um, and then we have a first, now just the two lines going straight exactly as, as usual, uh, empty, occupied, uh, the stars at the bottom, uh, free, free. And so that's nothing but one minus xy, um, t of x t star of y. Uh, do I agree with this in my notes? Yes. Oh, that's a relief. Um, and so you find something interesting, which is that these two uh, transfer matrices do not commute for a change. Uh, they satisfy the following commutation relation. Um, so whatever it is, so T, so I prefer usually to put the denominator, which way, yeah, the T and the denominator. So I guess um, um, T of X, T star of Y equals one minus T X, Y over one minus X, Y times T star of Y, T of X. Okay, uh, is that correct? One minus t. Yeah. Okay. So the, the corollary of this is you get this uh, following identity. Um, if you take the sum over lambda, all partitions of p lambda of x1 dot 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 xn, uh, q lambda of y1 dot 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 ym, I claim that th this is nothing but the sum, oh, sorry, the product. Um, over, so i from one to n, j from one to m, of pretty much that expression, right? So one minus t x i y j over uh, one minus x i y j. And the proof is kind of uh, trivial. You just re express this explicitly as being the sum of lambda, so this is the proof, um, of um, whatever right above, so empty uh, t of x1 dot 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 t of xn, uh, lambda, lambda, um, t star of y1, t star of yn, uh, empty. Now the summation of our lambda I can put in there and I realize this is just a decomposition of the identity. So this whole thing is just the identity, it's one. So all I get is basically a product of t and the product of t star and now, now I just apply repeatedly the commutation relation to move all the t stars to the left, and I get empty uh, t star of um, y1, t dot, dot, dot t star of yn, m, t of x1, t of xm, empty times all these factors we picked up, which are exactly the right product, double product of one minus t xi by j over one minus xi yj. And then this, finally, you have to check that this whole thing is one, basically. And this is essentially, a, trivial because you know the t and t star are kind of like triangular matrices they can only either you know t can only increase you know the, the number of boxes in some sense and t star can only, only decrease it so if you start from the empty you can only all you can do is stay at empty empty all the time basically so this is a routine check that uh, nothing survives in this case so you just get one and so you, you get the identity okay in the Remaining four minutes, let me just mention that there is a nice generalization of, of this result, uh, which is the formula due to Olivano, who sadly is not today uh, here, so it's not better anyway. I just wanted to point out the fact that uh, you can actually generalize this in the following way. Um, and maybe
maybe I'll take five extra minutes to say that. Yeah, that's, that's OK. Shouldn't take long. but So it's the exact same story, but with a twist. Um, now, assume that in this expression, the number of variables is equal. So n equals m. So we have polynomials p lambda x1, xn, q lambda y1, yn. So same number, so m equals n. Um, it's not very hard to see that um, for, for this expression to be non-zero, lambda can have at most n parts. So lambda is always uh, lambda 1 dot 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 lambda n. So I can always assume, by, if necessary, by padding to zeros, that it has exactly um, padding with zeros, that n has exactly, sorry, lambda has exactly n parts. It doesn't cost me anything. So, so how about, um, so I have this uh, now lambda, which is always exactly n parts. And that means, in particular, I can define a new concept, which is m0 of lambda. It's the number of zero parts. Just like I had before, the number of parts, which is non-zero. It's a bit weird to define it this way. But because we patterned it, that means this has a well-defined meaning. I'm not allowing a arbitrary number of zeros. That means if it so happens that your partition, you know, I'm always going to assume that it has size n, and that potentially there's going to be a bunch of uh, zero parts. And I'm calling them consistently with what before was called mi of lambda. Uh, M0 of lambda, the number zero parts. Now, as a consequence of uh, the exact same formalism, uh, you get this nice identity. Um, there we go. Um, you have to add the product j equals 1 to M0 of lambda of uh, 1 minus t to the power j. Um, and the claim is that this is nothing but our good old friend, the uh, domain world boundary condition partition function. So this is equal to, um, so you have the product of 1 minus t x i y j over, ah, oops, there's only one product, right? So this is a theorem that um, was originally due to uh, Ali Varner. Well, actually, did he prove it or did he conjecture it? You, you guys probably know better than that. I forget if he actually proved it in his original uh, Anyway, but this is a nice proof of a, of a result which at least was observed by, by uh, Olivaner first. Um, Ij equals 1 to n. Uh, the denominator nator is our favorite uh, von der Mond determinants. And then you have this uh, uh, Isagin uh, determinant, which is in, in these variables, it actually looks a bit simpler than what I wrote the other day. Uh, it's actually like this. And this is as usual uh, n by n determinant. And the proof is very simple, but uh, yeah, unfortunately I ran out of time. So the proof is very similar, but it involves now looking at, um, so adding one extra row to the, um, um, yeah, maybe I won't have time to say this in detail. But the, the basic idea is the, uh, we're gonna play the exact same game, but because we have those R matrices, so yeah, let me show you the, at least the, the, the picture of the proof is to consider configurations of this kind. Um, so we have, because at least you can see where the domain wall will naturally occur. So it's to consider configurations now where the, the left boundary is fixed, um, as well as the right boundary. So no more free boundaries. And, um, and then have the usual story. So lines here, and some of these are and then uh, have these lines cross. And, and have empty here. And there's, there's some stars to be put somewhere. So all these are stars. And all these are empty. Uh, so, sorry, all these are occupied here. And then apply repeatedly the RLL relation to move that to the other side. And so you get something like, well, the same picture. And now these go straight down, straight up, and then you still have, of course, the same thing. And the stars are on top, everywhere, and the boundaries are the same. And if you stare at this picture for a sufficiently long time, um, 
So I haven't said too much about what exactly happens at the left boundary. So that's a funny business, which, which is like the, the fact that even though we have fixed boundaries here, you can retranslate this back into the language of free boundaries at the cost of this extra factor, basically. So the extra factor comes from the fact that we change a little bit the left boundary, and it's, they're no more free. But there's some trick to reduce this to free boundaries, which is done in the paper. Reduce to free. Um, and if you do that, um, on the one hand, the usual argument applies that, uh, you know, these don't like to have um, this, these, all these, uh, all these states are actually fixed by the fact that at infinity, uh, the stars like occupancy and the, um, the uh, unstarred vertices like emptiness. So really all these are fixed. And this is already, you recognize your favorite, uh, no wait, which way does it go? Um, no, it's the other one. This one should be trivial. Um, no, I screwed up some. Yeah, I screwed up the, uh, sorry, yeah, at infinity I screwed up. This is supposed to be the other one, right? Because I definitely want the, the, these ones to be trivial. Sorry. Does that make more sense? Yes. Gosh, that was a mess, but yeah, so if you did it the way I did it, you would find nothing interesting. And so you have to play a bit with it. This is a bit of a game to find what produces interesting identities. Okay, so correction. So here, effectively, you get the summation over, uh, you have the left-hand side, because this is actually completely frozen. All of these paths, you know, the, the only thing that can happen here is these paths go through. And inversely here, um, it's not hard to see that, again, this is the argument that, uh, of triangularity, that really nothing ha can happen here in the rightmost region. That means it has to be this way. And all this is trivial, basically. And what, what you're left with is exactly your favorite path going from one side of a, right, of a square to another square side. So this is the domain world boundary condition partition function. And so you get the, the theorem this way. And um, yeah, it's just a nice proof uh, of a known result. Okay, I should probably stop here. I'm already over time.